because Surgenator is going to be waterproof and encased in potting compound. Good afternoon, everybody. This is a live extreme weather briefing this Sunday morning, and we have a lot to talk about, including an update on the fall color situation a cold front that is surging south through the southern, central and southern high plains right now that is going to become a Tawana pecker. Basically, that uh, happens when the cold front surges all the way south into uh, southern Mexico and then bleeds into the eastern tropical Pacific. And this is a pretty powerful cold front that's coming through. Uh, we've already reached our high temperatures today in eastern Colorado. And I also want to give you some updates on the Surgenator, which is a new storm surge sensor that's being developed by Mark or Chase and Spin on Twitter. I'm going to show you a couple of those uh, developments as well. We're hoping to have the Surgenator uh, ready to deploy uh, in time for next month, where there is some hints by the long-range models of uh, the development of a Central American gyre, which could result in a late-season hurricane across the Gulf of Mexico or the Western Caribbean. That's usually the location that we watch very closely for tropical cyclone development during the late season as the open Atlantic becomes a little bit more hostile, even though we do have a La Nina uh, that is definitely uh, well underway in the Pacific and in fact reaching maturity right now. And that leads to a reduction overall of wind shear across the Atlantic basin. It also leads to a suppression of Madden Julian oscillation activity going across uh, the Pacific Ocean. You have enhanced uh, deep layer wind shear across the Pacific. Uh, you have uh, uh, stronger uh, trade winds as well out there during these uh, types of conditions during a La Nina. And the last time we had a big a formidable La Nina like this was actually the 2011 winter. And that bled into the following spring with a very active uh, severe weather season during spring 2011. In fact, April 2011. Uh, was the most active month in recorded history in the U.S. for tornado activity. And it looks like this La Nina event could extend into spring as well, 2021, which could lead to a pretty active uh, Dixie Alley season. Uh, I'm also going to discuss the severe weather threat next Tuesday across portions of the Mid-Atlantic, maybe even the Southeast. Uh, there are definitely some discrepancies between the European model and the GFS and the evolution of that trough across the southern and southeastern U.S., but we're going to break down uh, that trough as well. And then I'm going to try my hand at uh, breaking down uh, the Madden Julian Oscillation and Calvin Wave propagation uh, across the Pacific, and that's basically a zone of enhanced convection that propagates very slowly across uh, the tropical, uh, the, the tropics uh, across this planet, usually at a period of about 30 to 60 days. Uh, basically, a very large blob of enhanced convection that propagates around uh, the tropical uh, the tropical belts uh, of the uh, of the planet and you also get Calvin waves which are higher frequency waves that can break off of that matted Julian oscillation and you have to factor in the sea surface temperature patterns in the tropical Pacific uh, because that definitely modulates uh, the propagation of these waves but as the matted Julian oscillation or the MJO and these Calvin, Calvin waves will propagate around the tropical belts of the globe you can use that as a proxy to see uh, which uh, uh, tropical basins will have enhanced convection or enhanced hurricane activity and uh, basically use that to make intra-seasonal predictions of what's going to happen in the tropics and also in the mid-latitudes as there definitely is uh, some modulation between the tropical belts and the mid-latitudes in terms of wet weather and climate. But I'm going to try my hand at breaking down the MJO and relate that uh, to the formation of a Central American gyre, uh, which should happen. Uh, toward the end of next week, uh, it looks like uh, that'll be in the eastern tropical Pacific into the southern Gulf of Mexico or the western Caribbean. Basically an area of, uh, of cyclonic flow and enhanced convection that's going to develop and they often re uh, result in these late season hurricanes. Uh, basically Hurricane Michael a couple of years ago uh, developed under a similar pattern. That was a late season hurricane that eventually made landfall on October 10, uh, 2018. So I'm not saying that a similar uh, pattern is going to unfold uh, in the Gulf of Mexico or the Western Caribbean, or even if there's going to be a U.S. landfall of a big hurricane. Uh, but some of the models are hinting at the formation uh, of a Central American gyre in a late season hurricane that could move from the Western Caribbean up into the Gulf of Mexico. Especially the GFS is hinting at that, and that appears to be associated with the Kelvin wave that is currently propagating uh, through the Central Pacific. It's eventually going to reach the Eastern Pacific. 
and that zone where the Central American gyre happens. Uh, that'll be an area of enhanced convection or an area of enhanced uh, uh, cyclonic uh, flow uh, that can uh, produce these tropical cyclones that often move into the Gulf of Mexico and can certainly uh, 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 resolve in some major impacts. We're going to be keeping an eye on that. And I am hoping that that surgeonator sensor that you can see right here, these are some videos uh, from Mark that he has uh, tried to develop these as quickly as possible to have that storm surge sensor ready to go for the next landfall next month. And also the, the news coming out of the National Weather Service Lake Charles here recently, measuring a storm surge watermark in excess of 17 feet uh, down near the Creole area uh, to the east of Cameron. Uh, that was where that uh, very powerful uh, right eye wall of Category 4 Hurricane Laura came ashore. So that definitely shows that those storm surge predictions verified uh, for Hurricane Laura, even though the center came in just a little bit further east, which sent that very uh, uh, strong uh, storm surge just to the east of the uh, Calcasieu area, the Lake Calcasieu area, the Calcasieu Canal as well. And if Hurricane Laura came in a little bit further west, then that 17 to 20 foot wall of water would have been coming right up the Calcasieu Channel uh, and then uh, uh, inundating Lake Charles with devastating flooding. Uh, but they did get hammered by extreme wind damage. Uh, the recovery continues there in southern Louisiana. But looking at some of those uh, photos from the damage survey of that storm surge that came into Cameron Parish and areas off to the east near the Creole area, uh, th those areas were absolutely ravaged by a storm surge that was likely approaching 20 feet. And uh, really the, uh, the National Weather Service Lake Charles had to go by those watermarks on structures. Uh, I know there, were, there was some noise that the geological survey had sensors up and down the coast, but I can't really find any of that data it appears that, that uh, the storm surge uh, was based on watermarks uh, left behind by structures that were still standing, uh, some stilts uh, that were left standing, even though the rest of the structures were obliterated by that wall of water that came in in the middle of the night with the right eye wall of uh, Hurricane Laura. But the development of the surgeonator sensors uh, by Team Dominator here, as made possible by the Facebook supporter community uh, that I've linked in the comments section here. In fact, all of our science is made possible uh, in part by the Facebook supporter community. But a lot of that was motivated, uh, the development of the surgeonator sensors was motivated uh, by this extreme storm surge uh, that impacted in many of the rural areas to the east of Cameron. And uh, it seemed like there was a lack of sensors or a lack of data to support uh, that devastating storm surge that came in and was so accurately predicted by the National Weather Service. So we're hoping to deploy these storm surge sensors that will also stream that data live up and down the coast out ahead of these hurricanes and try to result in a more dense uh, network of data of these storm surges that are coming in. And uh, it's based on uh, uh, measuring the weight of the water. Uh, it factors in the salinity as well, uh, because that is definitely an important factor when you're determining, determining the uh, weight or the pressure of a, uh, of a depth of water or a storm surge that's coming in. And so Mark has developed this genius concept uh, where this sensor uh, fits into a, a waterproofed PVC pipe uh, that extends below the water. Uh, it uses those electrodes to measure the salinity of the water, and then it's able to measure uh, the depth of the storm surge as it comes in in real time. And it's also going to connect to the cellular network, so this data is going to feed up uh, in real time to a website, so we're going to be able to monitor uh, that storm surge as it comes in. And again, we're hoping to have uh, that storm surge sensor ready to go uh, for the next hurricane. But first I wanted to start off just showing you some of these fall colors and then we'll move on to the surgeonator and then discuss the severe weather for next Tuesday and then discuss the Madden, Madden Julian, Julian oscillation. I'll show you that Kelvin wave of enhanced convection that's propagating across the central Pacific and is going to arrive in the eastern tropical Pacific and uh, be correlated with the development of that central American gyre. But these are the fall colors that I saw uh, out in the Vale region, captured them by Dominator drone. You could definitely see a lot of the smoke in the sky out there, just milky uh, white skies uh, in a lot of places uh, during the fall color season this year. And it's been incredibly dry uh, this warm season across the Rockies here. And that uh, suppressed a little bit of the color, definitely not as extreme as last year. Last year was an incredible season for the golden aspens out here across the Colorado Rockies. But with this drought, these dry conditions, and also the cold that came in, the early season snow that came in in early September, has led to some of the fall colors being relatively spotty, but you can certainly find areas of peak fall colors 
embedded within uh, the near peak colors or even uh, some of the dead leaves uh, that are, are experiencing many of these extreme climate conditions. There you can see though the bright blue skies finally uh, peeked through there out in Vail last week uh, in between smoke plumes and high clouds that were uh, coming by. But now today we're in a post frontal environment across the Colorado Rockies. We had a really stout cold front that came through. Uh, when that cold front came through last night, there was a big smoke plume that was associated with it as well. So the air quality rapidly deteriorated across the I-25 corridor. Uh, but that front is uh, surging off to the south uh, right now. I can show it to you on that surface map. And uh, we definitely reached our high temperatures uh, so far uh, today, definitely across uh, eastern Colorado and definitely uh, across uh, most of the uh, southern high plains. The front so far this morning is surging south uh, through western Texas. And usually these, uh, these cold fronts that are really intense like this that are trapped by the terrain to the west, so the Rocky Mountains to the west, often behave more like a bore or a gravity wave blasting off to the south. And this front will continue busting it south all the way to the Bay of Tehuantepec. And that's why we call these Tehuantepecers. They go through the Bay of Tehuantepec and then bleed in to the eastern portion of uh, the eastern tropical Pacific. And uh, that, that uh, uh, cold air will actually spill in uh, to the eastern tropical Pacific, going through the gap in the terrain there. Uh, but this is definitely a powerful uh, cold front. Temperatures plummeting back into the 40s here across the uh, fall color zone uh, in, in the Colorado Rockies and definitely plummeting as well across the uh, fall color zone there in, the, in uh, uh, northern central New Mexico and definitely blasting south to the southern high plains. Temperatures fall dramatically. The wind shift precedes that temperature gradient, and even ahead of the, the wind shift, you've got temperatures uh, approaching 80 right behind uh, the cold front. Temperatures actually rise just a little bit, and then that temperature gradient uh, comes in back behind it, and the depth of the cold air uh, begins to increase dramatically as you get further north. But that surface map definitely shows the uh, front that's surging off to the south, uh, so many of the people that waited until this weekend to see fall colors, the weather is not quite as favorable as it has been uh, here over over last week, uh, where it was quite quite perfect for uh, looking at fall colors. And so now I'm going to show you the Surgeonator videos here. First, we'll uh, start off with uh, the initial video uh, that Mark produced, and uh, this shows how complicated uh, these sensors are to develop. Mark builds them completely with his bare hands, uh, codes all the software as well, uh, and uh, all, all the software is also custom installed on these sensors. Uh, but here he's uh, designing the sensor boards for the subsonic sensor and the storm surge sensor. So our goal for our science mission for hurricanes uh, is to actually have a network of subsonic sensors or microbarometers that are measuring those very fine scale fluctuations, the gravity waves, the infrasound, uh, those pressure whipsaws, we're going to try to set up a network of those subsonic sensors out ahead of these hurricanes so that we can triangulate the individual features that we're measuring. Uh, those tornado-like vortices that are going around in the outer bands or the eye wall, those we're also going to measure with that network of subsonic sensors. And we're going to be measuring the storm surge with our network of uh, storm surge sensors called the Surgeonator. Uh, that was uh, uh, basically selected by social media, uh, basically the coolest sounding name uh, on there, also relating to the Dominator. Uh, but we're going to try to install uh, or set up a network of storm surge sensors ahead of these hurricanes as well to measure the water portion of these storms in addition to the pressure. And uh, this will all complement the Windy Palms project of Mike Tice, uh, setting up the anemometers and the barometers on palm trees ahead of these hurricanes to try to measure the strongest wind speeds that they're able to measure. And so now I'm going to show you this next video that Mark produced. And this shows the... Uh, Surgeonator sensor, the magnetic switch uh, that is being used. And uh, this magnetic switch is designed uh, because we need to be able to turn uh, this unit off and on despite this being underwater. So you don't want to have a switch that's going to be impacted uh, by the arrival of the storm surge. Or because Surgeonator is going to be waterproof and encased in potting uh, compound. Here I'll just let this video play. You can hear Mike's that be impacted by beautiful water. English accent. Uh, so I decided to go with the magnetic pull effect but I'll just let this play. switch just here. I'm just going to demonstrate that. You can see every time I pass the magnet, it resets.
Because Surgeon A2 is going to be waterproof and encased in potting compound, I needed a reset switch that wouldn't be impacted by water. Uh, so I decided to go with a magnetic Hall Effect switch just here. I'm just going to demonstrate that. So that's just an example of the magnetic switch that Mark has installed on the storm surge sensor here to turn it off and on. And uh, these sensors will fit inside of PVC pipe. I can show you the uh, surgeonator right now here. Uh, this still image uh, basically shows where these sensors will fit inside. So that PVC pipe that you can see in the upper portion of the screen, that's right here. This portion goes uh, beneath the water. And uh, these are those electrodes uh, that can measure the salinity of the water that it's embedded within. And then it uses the pressure difference uh, between this segment that is below the water and then a, a, a wire that extends well above the storm surge, potentially in excess of 30 feet long. We may need that wire uh, to be to extend above the highest observed storm surge, which was actually 28 feet in the Bay St. Louis and the uh, Waveland area during Hurricane Katrina. And then these are the individual uh, sensors. Uh, you can see the SD card as well uh, there that's able to record the data uh, locally. And we're also streaming the data live. And uh, just incredible technology that's getting developed uh, by Mark or Chase and Spin on uh, Twitter to try to collect uh, data inside uh, these powerful storms, hurricanes, and also tornadoes. Uh, measuring microbarometer data, infrasound slash gravity wave data. We're measuring storm surge height with our storm surge sensor. Windy Palms measuring wind speed, and Mark is working closely with Mike uh, to get that data to stream live. So definitely some incredible, uh, exciting things uh, that we have on the horizon. And again, we're hoping uh, that this will be de uh, developed in time for potential hurricanes uh, that could impact the western Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. This is the latest uh, GFS model, and even though this is just one run, it is hinting at the development of the Central American gyre here from the eastern tropical Pacific into the western Caribbean. And uh, it does look like a tropical cyclone is going to come out of this somewhere and possibly propagate north into the Gulf of Mexico. We've got a pretty good Rossby wave train moving across uh, North America, which will likely pick up uh, the tropical cyclone, lift it northward, and then eject it off to the northeast. Uh, but still, uh, there's a lot of discrepancies between the models. The GFS is definitely showing the development of the Central American gyre. Uh, the European model is definitely less aggressive, uh, really not showing that. And uh, there's definitely differences between the GFS and the European model in the evolution of the Matt and Julian oscillation and how strong of a Kelvin wave is able to survive uh, the harsh environment of the uh, tropical Pacific where La Nina is developing. Uh, but here you can see the uh, GFS model just coming out 12Z this morning, still showing uh, the development of that Central American gyre by the end of next week. This is Friday morning, showing a tropical cyclone uh, developing off the coastline there of Honduras and uh, probably will lift off to the north toward the Yucatan, eventually into the western Gulf of Mexico. But really you don't want to look at the uh, exact details of what develops out of this. Really all you need to know is that the GFS model shows the development of a Central American gyre pattern, uh, basically an area of cyclonic uh, flow, uh, vorticity or enhanced convection out here. And uh, oftentimes they'll produce these late season hurricanes uh, this time of year that can sometimes move into the Gulf of Mexico. But we're going to discuss the relationship between the current state of the Madden Julian oscillation, uh, the forecast of how it's going to evolve, uh, basically the difference between the MJO and Kelvin waves. Some people say that they're more synonymous. Uh, and also the role of La Nina in the tropical Pacific, uh, increasing the wind shear across that basin and really making it a hostile environment for convective maxes to even propagate around. And uh, that's why uh, so far this warm season, that MJO has largely remained uh, relatively stationary over the Indian Ocean region with an enhancement of convection out there with just little pieces of that MJO breaking off and moving across the Pacific Basin, across the Atlantic, and uh, leading to a modulation of tropical cyclone activity, which has absolutely been record-breaking so far this year. But as we go into early next week, so this is about 10 days, you can see that uh, we'll, we'll likely be watching very closely around October 7 to uh, 10 time period for the development of a tropical cyclone in the Gulf. But again, that's uh, just the GFS that we're looking at so far. And going back to the GFS here again, let's take a look at the uh, development of the severe weather pattern that could evolve across portions of the Mid-Atlantic. This is on the uh, incredible 
Pivotal Weather website. This is Sunday night, basically tonight. You can see this uh, big time uh, wave-like pattern here, a giant ridge developing across uh, the western U.S., which is likely going to fuel the wildfire pattern out there again next week. But look at this massive trough that is digging off to the south and definitely intensifying. You can see there's going to be a lot of flow here on the backside. It's going to develop a negative tilt as it moves into the southeastern U.S. as well. And it could result in some severe weather across portions of the mid-Atlantic, depending how it's going to evolve. But you can see as this uh, trough continues to dig, it leads to just some subtle ridging upstream, which means that this is more of a stagnant pattern. It's not going to be a very progressive trough ejection. Uh, but uh, this trough gaining a neutral and eventually a negative tilt with this ridging developing upstream, up, upstream is going to allow for a uh, low-level jet to develop and intensify to the east of the Appalachians and uh, should bring some severe weather on Tuesday afternoon and evening across portions of North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, maybe Georgia as well. Uh, but just ahead of this system, likely going to be a squall line that moves through, maybe even some tornado potential. Um, but I think mainly severe weather. You can see that there's not a very robust low-level jet downstream of this feature. Still needs to, uh, it's still a long ways out on Tuesday too. So as we get uh, within the NAM uh, forecast range, I think we're going to see this low-level jet a little bit further west, a less progressive pattern, more ridging aloft, a stronger upper-level system. And I do think uh, that this low-level jet could verify a little bit further west, closer to the Appalachians. And uh, just the, the GFS is having a little bit trouble resolving those fine scale features. Even so though, by Tuesday night, it definitely shows a very intense low level jet uh, developing across Eastern North Carolina, coastal Virginia, even portions of the Delmarva. So I think there's gonna be a skinny, fast moving squall line that's gonna progress across portions of the mid-Atlantic. Probably some embedded tornado vortices within that squall line as well. Uh, but I think that as the uh, models get a little bit closer to this event, we're going to see uh, that low-level jet verify further west. Uh, there it looks like the European, uh, this is probably the 0Z model, yeah, the 0Z run last night, does show a slower progression of that upper system and maybe an earlier intensification of that low-level jet a little bit closer to the Appalachians. Uh, but the European and the GFS are both showing the potential of mid-Atlantic severe weather with this system. I've been monitoring this system pretty closely to see if it could even warrant chase potential or even blasting out to the mid-Atlantic. Right now, though, it does look like uh, the trough ejection may not be as clean as it could be. Uh, and uh, it looks like the moisture situation, the lack of an elevated mix layer, is probably going to lead to one of those skinny squall lines that you often get over this region with an intensifying upper system like this. Let's see what the GFS has for dew points out there. There is definitely some dew points uh, near 70 dew points into the 70s that stream northward out ahead of this uh, upper system. So this is definitely a close one to watch uh, as we go through uh, next week. Let me make sure that my head isn't blocking this. Sometimes that happens. But this is just a, a beautiful trough, strong jet that's migrating back south out of Canada, as often happens during the fall season. Uh, I'm still wondering if there's going to be a, a severe weather season this fall. I think it's going to be a little bit later, probably the second half of October into November. Uh, we could see a fall season uh, activate here across the Great Plains. But this one is the first real fall. Well, we just had a couple days ago, there was a tornadic water spout uh, that was near the Myrtle Beach area that I posted on here. Uh, that was So the fall season could be setting up to be quite active across the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeast uh, with this ridge developing across the Western U.S., the tendency for these troughs to dig and intensify across the southeastern U.S. upon ejection, uh, leading to a narrow zone uh, to the east of the Appalachians where moisture can stream northward, where a low-level jet can intensify. And I bet that we're settling into a pattern this fall where there's going to be quite a bit of severe weather across the east coast and these troughs that evolve across the eastern U.S. And likely one of these troughs is going to pick up a potential tropical cyclone that could develop in the western Caribbean uh, or the southwestern Gulf of Mexico and the lift northeastward ahead of that pattern. But that's the uh, severe weather event that we'll keep a close eye on as we go through early next week. Uh, once it gets uh, inside the NAM envelope, uh, we'll start looking at it quite a bit uh, closer, and I do believe it is actually inside the NAM envelope now. So here's the NAM for Tuesday evening. 
And we should be able to look at the 12Z NAM as well. A beautiful system, and it looks like the 12Z NAM from 0Z to uh, this morning's run has actually led to a stronger upper level storm system, uh, attaining a neutral tilt uh, by Tuesday afternoon and evening. A low level jet uh, will also develop out ahead of this feature. Let's see if the NAM. So the NAM does have a more robust low level jet developing as early as 0Z, 7 or 8, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, Eastern North Carolina into Eastern Virginia. A little bit more veered uh, down in eastern South Carolina here. But let's see what the thermodynamics look like near that 50 knot low level jet. And look at that hodograph right there. That is a textbook hodograph for tornado potential. The thermodynamics definitely lacking. You can see it's basically saturated the whole way up through the troposphere. I probably just clicked on some convection actually or some precipitation here because that is definitely condensed all the way up. Lapse rates are going to be an issue. So you can see how there's a lot of latent heat release with these lapse rates. These are definitely not the uh, definitely not the uh, most unstable profile here. Uh, almost moist adiabatic all the way up, uh, but definitely a lot of wind shear already being indicated by the NAM in that warm sector across eastern North Carolina. There, a strong low-level jet of about 50 knots, favorable critical angles as well, and not surprisingly. Uh, looks like a, a tornado type of a sounding there. Just look at the supercell composite by the NAM just for fun. It is showing eastern North Carolina uh, kind of as a hot spot there for supercell potential. It's probably going to be a skinny squall line. But even where there's the best instability, you can see the, the lack of an elevated mix layer, that dry slot of air that comes in in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. That is so important to steepening those lapse rates developing that instability in these warm sectors and then leading to the development of renegade supercells that could take full advantage of this wind shear. But that's a pretty incredible hodograph right there uh, in eastern North Carolina on Tuesday afternoon. So this is a uh, system that we are certainly going to have to watch. Definitely going to have to watch uh, this setup. That's a, a favorable critical angle for an eastern U.S. Uh, type of a hodograph. A low-level jet that's going to verify even greater than 40 knots uh, earlier, further west, closer to the Appalachians. So this is definitely a system that we're going to have to watch. The models are definitely not uh, picking up on how rapidly that upper-level system is going to intensify and uh, how quickly it's going to develop that negative tilt. But I do think that there is a decent chance of tornadoes um, across portions of central eastern North Carolina, southeastern Virginia, maybe even eastern South Carolina, but it is looking like a North Carolina, Virginia, Delmarva type of an event. Skinny squall line, big wind shear, 50 knot low level jet. Uh, but if we can develop a little bit drier air coming in at the mid-levels at 500 millibars, then I think that it could be a pretty substantial uh, severe weather event. So now let's go back to the tropics really quickly. And I wanted to just touch on the intraseasonal uh, conditions that are happening out here uh, and start talking about the Matt and Julian Oscillation. And the Matt and Julian Oscillation is a belt or a blob basically of enhanced convection uh, that propagates around the globe very slowly uh, with a period of about 30 to 60 days. Uh, the 30 day periods are more Kelvin wave type of activity. Uh, those uh, are, are smaller blobs of enhanced convection that propagate around the globe and will often break off of the Matt and Julian oscillation. And, uh, but overall, there's also the La Nina conditions that are dominating the tropical Pacific. And that uh, is basically the development of, of, of cold uh, water across the tropical Pacific from the dateline uh, through the eastern tropical Pacific. That leads to a reduction in deep layer wind shear across the Atlantic Basin and usually more active than normal hurricane seasons. In the Pacific, it leads to greater wind shear across most of the Pacific Basin and that leads overall to a suppression of convection across the Pacific. And overall, there's been a lot of convection across, uh, across the uh, Indian Ocean as well uh, and uh, bleeding into the Western Pacific. And here you can see those blue colors uh, basically uh, representing deeper convection, colder cloud tops, uh, that convection, uh, convection extending deeper up into the troposphere. This is an area of suppressed convection, and uh, this represents one of those Kelvin waves or basically a smaller 
a lobe of the Madden Julian Oscillation that broke off from this larger blob of convection over the Indian Ocean, propagated across uh, the tropical Pacific, eventually reaching the Atlantic, leading to an uptick uh, in tropical cyclone activity uh, there in mid to late August uh, that uh, indirectly led to the development of Hurricane Laura. We, remember, we had two tropical cyclones in the Gulf of Mexico with Marco uh, and with Laura out there, but that's about when uh, Laura occurred was during this period of increased activity uh, in the tropical Atlantic. And then overall, since then, we've been dominating by, uh, dominated by subsidence across the Atlantic Basin, and that's led uh, to a reduction of those tropical cyclones. You may remember that we had all those storms out there in the tropical Atlantic. Many of those recurved. Uh, Sally, though, uh, developed in uh, the Gulf of Mexico and ended up uh, coming ashore as a uh, Category 2 storm. So it looks like this record-breaking tropical season is going to reinvigorate in October, in uh, early to middle, middle October, around the October 7 through 10 time frame with the development of the Central American Gyre. And what's going to happen is this uh, MJO-related blob of enhanced uh, convection that right now is over the Indian Ocean, a piece of that has broken off and right now is propagating across uh, the uh, Central uh, Pacific. Uh, approaching the dateline and eventually that Kelvin wave is going to reach uh, the eastern tropical Pacific and uh, that could result in the development of a Central American gyre. But the conditions in the Pacific for convection are extremely hostile right now because of the cold anomalies uh, that are in the tropical Pacific, uh, the enhanced wind shear, basically the anomalous 200 millibar zonal flow. Uh, you have uh, enhanced western or anomalous westerlies at the high levels that are associated uh, with the uh, uh, development of the uh, of, of the La Nina conditions in the Pacific, and so that leads to a, a sm smaller blobs of enhanced convection that are able to survive the tropical Pacific and make it to the eastern tropical Pacific and eventually into the Caribbean, and uh, that's uh, what many of the models, especially the GFS, are beginning to pick up on. And I could show you these diagrams that show the propagation of the Madden Julian Oscillation with time. And usually when the MJO is in this period, that's when you get uh, an active Atlantic or an active tropical Atlantic in terms of convection. You get an uptick uh, in the uh, convection there. And this is exactly what happened during the end of October. The purple here, or, or, or August, the purple here is uh, August. And then you transition to the next month, which is September. And this shows that the MJO is definitely very slowly moving. And it's, it's going to reside uh, for the most part uh, over the... Uh, uh, over the Indian Ocean before uh, a lobe will break off and propagate into the Western Pacific. Right now, though, it's already over the Central Pacific. You can see a Kelvin wave that's propagating across that's eventually going to reach the Eastern Tropical Pacific and could lead to the formation of a Central American gyre. But right now, with the Madden Julian Oscillation centered over the Indian Ocean, it's leading to a convectively suppressed state across the tropical Atlantic, and that's why. Uh, very eerily, we have no tropical storms out there, whereas just recently we've been tracking numerous uh, uh, tropical, tropical cyclones that were out in the tropical Atlantic. And so this also shows how it will forecast out with time. Uh, this is based on the, G, uh, the GFS ensemble runs here, uh, which is more favorable uh, for the development of the Central American gyre uh, as, the, as compared to the European, which doesn't show anything out there. Uh, but I do think that eventually uh, the European will come on board uh, with the GFS and uh, likely show the development of that gyre. But these numbers right here, the 8 and the 1 phase of the Madden Julian Oscillation are when it's a uh, favored phase for convection across the Atlantic. And I'm going to show you really quickly this composite diagram. And this is from the Climate Prediction Center, NSEP. Uh, these diagrams were pulled from their latest report. And this is a composite which uh, shows what happens in the tropics under the different phases, those numbers that I just showed you. These are phase 8 and phase 1, which is favored in the tropical Atlantic for convection. These are composites right here. So this is the tropical Atlantic. This uh, uh, basically favors tropical cyclone development for those waves that come off of uh, West Africa and begin to move across the Atlantic. Interestingly, this year, though, many of the uh, uh, hurricanes uh, that are becoming impactful in the U.S. are developing further west, some of them even coming by surprise, whereas last year, the years before, we would be tracking these tropical cyclones way across the Atlantic, 
many times they'd mature into these monsters out there uh, and then impacting the lesser Antilles, the greater Antilles as they move across, and then eventually even threatening uh, the United States, often moving into the Gulf, but you can track them for days uh, from when they're coming off West Africa as waves. But this season, one thing I'm noticing is that the impactful hurricanes are developing further west, across the Gulf of Mexico, across the Western Caribbean. Oftentimes they're coming by surprise. Uh, they're just uh, blobs of convection that will eventually form in uh, to hurricanes. You remember Hurricane Laura uh, that uh, kept propagating west, battling that western wind shear. And then when it got further west, eventually it found itself in a more favorable environment for rapid intensification, intensified on approach, made landfall as a Category 4 storm. But Laura was definitely occurring when the MJO was in a favorable phase for the Atlantic, the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, favoring a a convectively active period. Right now, though, the Madden Julian oscillation is uh, centered over the uh, Indian Ocean right now. And uh, when that happens, uh, little pieces can break off. Sometimes the whole entire blob uh, will propagate around the globe very slowly. But in this case, with La Nina dominating uh, the tropical Pacific, basically the cold water in the tropical Pacific, uh, you have increased wind shear. Uh, and those sea surface temperatures vary much more slowly than the intraseasonal uh, variability of the Madden Julian oscillation or these low frequency oscillations in the tropics that happen in the atmosphere. Sea surface temperatures change much more slowly, especially in the tropics. And with that cold water residing in the tropical Pacific, it just continues to suppress those areas of enhanced convection that try to propagate from the Western Pacific into this hostile zone in the central and eastern tropical pacific where there's enhanced wind shear uh, basically enhanced trades out there but these are composites uh, just to show you what to expect with the different phases uh, from this diagram as you can track the mjo and uh, little kelvin waves as they uh, go across uh, the tropical pacific so this is actually an average uh, this is also uh, from the Climate Prediction Center, or NCEP, and uh, this is what was happening between se September 15 and September 20, showing that uh, Madden Julian Oscillation just dominating over the Indian Ocean. Here's the western coast of North, uh, of, uh, North America. Uh, here is the uh, uh, western coast of, uh, of uh, South America uh, near, uh, near uh, Peru, and uh, this is basically the equator out here. This is the Pacific Basin. And look at how suppressed it is uh, con for convection out there uh, in the Pacific. This is a textbook La Nina uh, pattern as well in the tropical Pacific, where you get a reduction of convection across the eastern tropical Pacific. But what you can see in September 20 is this little blob here of enhanced convection that is broken off from the larger blob of enhanced convection associated with that MJO. Now, this is being classified by most meteorologists as a Kelvin wave, and this will continue to propagate uh, from west to east. Uh, just to the north of the, of the equator, with that uh, equator acting as a boundary. Uh, and this uh, Kelvin wave will continue to propagate to, to the east, eventually reaching the eastern tropical Pacific. And the GFS is uh, hinting at the development of a Central American gyre out here in the eastern tropical Pacific into the western Gulf of Mexico, which could lead to the development of a late season hurricane around October uh, 7 through 10. And you can also see uh, the modulation between ENSO and the Madden Julian oscillation uh, with this uh, Hobmuller diagram of a velocity potential, uh, basically a five day running mean. This is the enhanced uh, convection there associated with the MJO that is moving pretty slowly out here, just a blob of convection. And uh, that MJO wants to propagate from west to east across the basins, but notice how it loses its identity across the Pacific. That's because of La Nina uh, that is basically acting counter to these convective blobs that are trying to propagate across the Pacific and eventually reaching uh, the Atlantic basins as well. But it still happens. Uh, they're just harder to track during La Nina's when it's such a hostile environment for convection. But this is what happened uh, in the second half of, of August uh, when intraseasonal meteorologists uh, were watching this uh, MJO or area of enhanced convection moving across the Pacific and eventually reaching the Atlantic Basin. And usually will reinvigorate or regain its identity uh, during La Nina years when it reaches the Atlantic because it's a more, uh, La Ninas are, are favorable for convection and a reduction of wind shear overall in the Atlantic Basin. 
Uh, the opposite happens in the Atlantic Basin as compared to the Pacific Basin during La Nina events. Uh, but you could definitely see a reinvigoration of this. This is a failed attempt uh, earlier in July, uh, but now we're starting to get into this more classic MJO activity uh, here as we're getting into the, the later fall. But you can still see the, the La Nina pattern, La Nina-like pattern that's happening uh, with the uh, convective blobs losing their identity over the Pacific, but then regaining it over the Atlantic Basin. And uh, it looks like we're trying to get a, a piece of that MJO uh, to break off. And right now it's moving across uh, the Central Pacific as a Kelvin wave, not this massive blob that you're going to see, but it naturally loses its identity as it moves across the Central Pacific anyway because it's less favorable for convection than the Western Pacific or the Indian Ocean where you have very, very warm waters out there, less wind shear, less dry air. But this is the uh, Kelvin wave that we're tracking moving across the Central Pacific right now that is uh, likely going to reach the Eastern Tropical Pacific and be associated with the development of that Central American gyre. And I'm not very comfortable with this uh, intra-seasonal meteorology. I'm definitely more comfortable with smaller scale meteorology like the forecasting of tornadoes or the forecasting of the mesoscale or the measuring of data inside these small scale features. But my PhD was in intra-seasonal meteorology and uh, relating ENSO and other Pacific Ocean sea surface temperature patterns to climate regimes downstream. But it's definitely not one of my strong points, especially analyzing tropical meteorology in the barotropics, but still I can make a, a, a strong effort at it. So this shows the uh, 200 millibar wind anomalies, basically zonal wind anomalies across the tropical belt. And uh, these stronger winds aloft here across the Pacific are classic La Nina patterns where you get these stronger westerly winds aloft, not as favorable for convection. Here you can see it's quite favorable for convection though over the Indian Ocean into portions of the Western Pacific. Every now and then though a Kelvin wave can, or a MJO or basically a wave of enhanced convection can propagate across the Pacific and uh, reach the Atlantic. Uh, but during La Niña's, even though the Pacific, uh, the Central and Eastern Tropical Pacific is largely not favorable for convection, the Atlantic on the other hand is. And you can see all the way through summer, uh, definitely favorable for convection. You get a reduction of wind shear. This is a uh, anomalously low zonal wind at 200 millibars, which is associated with the reduction of deep layer wind shear across the Atlantic. And that's why we've had such an active record-breaking Atlantic season with La Nina uh, corresponding with an active West African monsoon, many systems that are coming off the West African coast correlated with anomalously warm waters across the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean and the tropical Atlantic has definitely led to an above normal season. Even though most of the systems that are coming off West Africa into the heart of the Atlantic are either dying in a hostile environment or recurving to the north, the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean have produced many storms. And those are the ones that have been impactful on the U.S. The exception being Isaias that impacted the uh, east coast of the U.S. as a recurving storm, late uh, recurving and uh, coming ashore there as a category one hurricane in eastern North Carolina. So these are the 850s, uh, 850 wind uh, anomalies, looking at more of a map to kind of show you uh, the role uh, of La Nina. So during La Nina, you get an enhancement of the trade winds across uh, the tropical Pacific. You get an enhancement of the wind shear. You basically get an enhancement of the Hadley cell. Uh, you get enhanced uh, upper level winds in the upper troposphere, which leads to greater wind shear. But basically what happens uh, during La Niña's, when you get all that upwelling and those negative anomalies that uh, develop in the central and eastern tropical Atlantic is you get a stronger Hadley cell, stronger easterly trades at the low levels, but also stronger e uh, westerlies aloft. And the opposite happens in the Atlantic Basin. So out there in the Atlantic Basin, you get weaker trades and that forms as, and that uh, shows up as anomalous west to east, 850 or low level flow out there across the tropical belt and a reduction of wind shear. So this is definitely correlated uh, with La Nina. You get a reduction of wind shear across the tropical basin uh, and that includes the uh, Gulf of Mexico and the Western Caribbean 
And uh, this is in part why we've had such an active uh, hurricane season across the Atlantic, uh, but suppressed convection across the Pacific. A lot of convection, though, uh, uh, across the Indian Ocean into the Western Pacific with uh, little lobes or pieces of that enhanced convection breaking off and moving across the uh, Atlantic, eventually arriving in the Eastern Tropical Pacific and the Atlantic where it results in an uptick in the tropical convection. So that's really what we're dealing with right now. And uh, the, um, the GFS model uh, definitely shows a uh, more robust area of uh, enhanced convection, able to break off the MJO, move across uh, the tropical Atlantic, and uh, eventually resulting in the formation of the Central American gyre and maybe even a, a Gulf of Mexico hurricane that could impact portions of the Gulf Coast toward the middle of October. But this is what we're going to be watching. Hopefully we'll get the surgeonator complete and ready to go for this deployment. Uh, but all eyes are going to be on the Mid-Atlantic also, Eastern North Carolina, Southeastern Virginia on Tuesday for a potential severe weather event. And uh, we also have this cold front that's blasting to the south. It's going to become a Tawana pecker. We've got fall colors that are going to start invigorating across the central and eastern U.S. I know there's near peak color across northern Minnesota right now, northern Wisconsin, and the upper peninsula. I'm going to continue my leaf peeping activity. But just wanted to say thank you to uh, the Facebook supporter group, making it possible for me to storm chase through these crazy times and continue delivering my live weather reports. I plan on launching a storm chasing school as well uh, for the supporter community. Uh, one night a week, maybe a couple nights, I'm going to do pure meteorological education and uh, also trying to get people on the path to becoming storm chasers that are interested. Uh, so that's also going to be something I'm going to focus on uh, during the off season uh, for the supporter community and beyond. So thank you, everybody. I hope you guys enjoy my weather reports and I hope you have a great Sunday and uh, hopefully uh, you enjoy your uh, NFL football today as well. Uh, football's back. I know that Oklahoma lost yesterday, which was quite disappointing. But we always lose to Kansas State uh, in the early season and then rebound and then end up uh, getting the playoff or having a Heisman or uh, even getting to the national title game. Hopefully we'll win another national title here this year, but I still expect multiple national titles over the next four years during the Spencer Rattler career. But anyway, thank you everybody for joining me this Sunday morning, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and I hope you enjoy my weather reports.